Hey, have you ever pondered the mystery of PARP inhibitors in cancer treatment? If yes, you are in the right place. This webinar titled Decoding PARP Inhibitors, A New Hope in Hereditary Cancer is prepared by Shifat, Norin, and Kamalika from the MHSC Medical Genomics Program at the University of Toronto. But before we dive into understanding PARP, let us take a look at the cancer itself. As per the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, around 240,000 women are diagnosed with breast cancer, and 18,500 are diagnosed with ovarian cancer annually in the United States only. We might all differ by color and ethnicity, but we are made up of tiny units called cells. The cell is a complex structure controlling and maintaining our body function. At the center of the cell lies the nucleus which functions as the brain of the cell. The nucleus controls and regulates the activities of the cell such as growth and metabolism. It also hosts the critical genetic structures that carry hereditary information. These genetic structures are called chromosomes, which exist in 23 pairs and carry all our genes. Enter BRCA or breast cancer genes, the stars of our story. BRCA are two types, BRCA1 in chromosome number 17 and BRCA2 in chromosome number 13. Now you might be wondering what BRCA genes are. Think of these BRCA genes as diligent workers in a DNA repair shop, tirelessly fixing any damage that comes their way. They're like the maintenance crew of our bodies, ensuring that our cells remain healthy and robust. They work round the clock to repair any DNA hiccups, stopping tumors before they have a chance to spread and cause damage. However, even our superheroes have their Achilles heel. In the case of BRCA genes, this vulnerability comes in the form of mutations. If there is a glitch or mutation in these genes, the functions of the genes are lost and the risk of cancer increases significantly. Do not consider this as a rare occurrence. In fact, these mutations are observed in roughly 3% of breast cancers and about 10% of ovarian cancers. This is collectively referred to as hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome or HBOC. Enough of information. Let's take a break and see if we can answer this quiz. Which of the following factors could drive the risk of breast cancer? Is it A, hereditary, B, environmental, C, lifestyle, or D, all of these? If you have answered D, pat yourself and collect two points in your piggy bag. If BRCA mutation is hereditary, what happens if one of the parents has the mutation? Well, it's like rolling the dice in a game where the odds are evenly split. A child always receives one copy of the gene from each parent. If one of the parents has a BRCA mutation, there is a 50-50 chance the child could inherit the abnormal or mutated gene. However, let us clarify something important here. Inheriting this mutation increases the risk, but does not guarantee that you will develop cancer. You see each of us has a pair of these BRCA genes, one from each parent. If you inherit a mutated gene from one parent, you still have another potentially healthy BRCA gene from the other parent, acting like a functional backup and preventing cancer. It is when a second mutation strikes this other BRCA gene, that the situation becomes murky. It is like a ship whose both engines have failed, and disaster is inevitable. All right, it is time to collect more points. So, based on what we have seen and learned, can you say if the following statement is true or false? If the cell inherits one mutated copy of BRCA, it becomes cancerous. If you answered false, collect two more points in your piggy bag. Now we know one bad copy of BRCA increases the risk of cancer. So how prevalent is this in the general population? Around 12% of women will develop breast cancer at some point in life. However, the risk increases if they carry BRCA mutations. It is understood having BRCA1 mutation increases the risk of developing cancer to 55 to 72 percent by age 70, while the risk is around 45 to 69 percent for BRCA2 mutations. Even men can get breast cancer. While the general risk for men is low at 0.1 percent, the risk increases to 1 to 2 percent for BRCA1 and 6 to 8 percent for BRCA2 mutations. Around 1 to 2 percent of women will develop ovarian cancer sometime during their lives. But if they carry a non-functioning BRCA gene then the lifetime risk increases to 39 to 44 percent for BRCA1 and 11 to 17 percent for BRCA2 mutations. Hmm, you must be wondering where PARP is in all of these. Just relax and sit tight as we take you on a journey of PARP and PARP inhibitors. Remember BRCA are like repair workers. Similarly, PARP which stands for poly-ADP ribose polymerase plays a key function in this DNA repair process. 
The DNA is constantly exposed to damage and factors like PARP helps to recruit repair proteins to fix the damage. This ensures that DNA remains intact and the cell survives. So, you can see PARP repairs the damaged DNA and prevents cell death. This is fabulous if the repair is taking place in a healthy cell. Can you tell why this would not be advisable in cancerous cells? Consider the repairmen fixing a broken ladder. Would you want them to fix a ladder that will give unauthorized access to your cells and cause them to become cancerous? This is where the game changer in our story comes, the PARP inhibitors. These inhibitors are like sneaky characters in our tale, working behind the scenes to bring the villain, the cancer cells to its knees. They do this by stopping the PARP from repairing the single strand breaks in the DNA. But then again, if DNA break or damage is common to all cells, how do PAPR inhibitors affect only cancerous cells and not normal cells? This is where an awesome concept called synthetic lethality comes into play. Synthetic lethality occurs when two different conditions alone cannot cause a toxic effect. To be toxic, they need to act together. So how is synthetic lethality linked to PARP inhibitory action? We know PARP is an important factor in the repair pathway, and it corrects single-strand breaks in DNA. So if PARP is prevented from functioning, then there will be an accumulation of single-strand breaks. This will eventually lead to more complex double-strand breaks in DNA. At this stage, this can still be repaired by another repair mechanism called homologous recombination, where BRCA proteins play important parts. But then what happens if you do not have functioning BRCA genes like in ovarian and breast cancers? In BRCA mutated cells, instead of homologous recombination, another repair pathway called the non-homologous end-joining pathway is activated. This unfortunately leads to incorrect repair that will result in genomic instability and eventually cause cell death. Time for another knowledge check. Complete the sentence. Synthetic lethality occurs when two different conditions act, independently, separately, together or sequentially. Correct answer is option C together. Ever wondered about the different types of PARP inhibitors and how they work? Well, this fascinating group of drugs has a crucial role in treating certain types of cancer. Among them, we have five main types, Oleparib, Talazaparib, Rucaparib, Viliparib, and Niraparib. Each one of these inhibitors has its unique properties and uses. But today, we'll be focusing on the star player, Olaparib. Olaparib has garnered special attention because it has been approved by Health Canada for the treatment of hereditary breast cancer. This approval is a significant milestone in our fight against this widespread disease, offering a ray of hope to many. But how exactly does this drug work? Who can be offered this treatment? And what precautions need to be taken while on this medication? Let's delve into the world of Olaparib, its uses and how it operates. Well, before Olaparib becomes an option, doctors need to determine if you've inherited an abnormal BRCA gene. This is done through genetic testing using samples from cancerous tumors, blood, or saliva. If you carry this abnormal gene and are in the early stages of breast cancer with a high risk, you might be a candidate for this treatment. High risk here means there's a substantial chance of the cancer returning after a period of recovery. The PARP inhibitors like Olaparib are also offered to patients who've had surgery to remove the tumor and have either HR positive and HER2 negative breast cancer or triple negative breast cancer. These patients should have received chemotherapy before or after surgery, or a combination of both. If these conditions are met, Olaparib can be administered within 12 weeks of the last treatment which includes surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy. In the medical field, Olaparib is also referred to as maintenance therapy. So, can you tell when should Olaparib treatment begin? Is it option A within 12 weeks of last treatment, option B within 12 days of last treatment, or option C after 12 weeks of last treatment. The correct answer is option A within 12 weeks of last treatment. Yay, more coins in your bag. Now that we know who can be offered Olaparib, how is it actually administered? This medication is typically taken twice daily. It can be taken with or without food, depending on your preference. If you happen to miss a dose, don't panic. Just take the next dose at the scheduled time and avoid the temptation to double up on the dosage to make up for the missed one. Let's talk precautions. For starters, Olaparib should not be taken by pregnant women or those who are breastfeeding. 
This is due to the risk of it affecting the developing fetus. It's also important to inform your doctor of any medical history, such as lung problems, a history of smoking, liver issues, or allergies. You may be asked to do a blood test to check for hepatitis B as well. Additionally, it's crucial to let your doctor know about any other medications you may be taking. This includes everything from prescribed drugs to herbal medications and supplements. And while we're on the topic of things to avoid, you might want to skip the grapefruit and bitter oranges when you're on this medication. Why, you may ask? Well, certain foods and medications could interfere with how Olaparib works in your body. To truly comprehend the importance, we must delve a bit into the realm of biochemistry and focus on something called the CYP3A enzyme. This enzyme plays a crucial role in our bodies. It's like the diligent caretaker of our system, ensuring that once medications like Olaparib have done their job, they are efficiently broken down and removed. Now, imagine if this caretaker is distracted or hindered from doing its job. Certain foods, such as grapefruit juice or bitter oranges, and medications like itraconazole can do just that. What happens then? The drug starts to accumulate, and this can lead to a toxic buildup. This is not just a minor issue. It can have serious side effects that could complicate your treatment and overall health. What are the side effects of taking this medication? A question often asked, and rightfully so. You might experience unwanted effects like nausea and vomiting. While unpleasant, these can often be managed with anti-nausea medications. Extreme tiredness could also be a side effect, a feeling that doesn't seem to go away with rest or sleep. To navigate this, try incorporating at least 30 minutes of exercise into your day and drink plenty of water. You could also experience symptoms such as weakness, shortness of breath, dizziness or noticing pale skin and cold hands and feet. These could be indicative of low red blood cell count or anemia, on the other hand, if you are feeling hot, unwell, or experiencing chills or a new cough, then this could be a sign of low white blood cells or neutropenia. Another side effect could involve low platelets count or thrombocytopenia, causing bruising and bleeding from gums, nose, and other parts of body. And lastly, some people may experience diarrhea, constipation, and changes in taste. It's important to note that while rare, there can be fatal side effects like pneumonitis affecting your lungs and other types of cancer like myelitis plastic syndrome or acute myeloid leukemia. To minimize these side effects, it's advised to have regular testing. This allows for monitoring of your blood count, checks the condition of your liver and kidneys, and keeps an eye on other symptoms. Time for another quiz. So if you are experiencing weakness, shortness of breath, dizziness, or pale skin, this could suggest a low count for which of the following? A. White blood cells. B, red blood cell, or C, platelets? The correct answer is option B, red blood cells. Now, when should you stop taking the medication? This is a decision made by your doctor under three conditions, disease recurrence, extremely high clinical toxicity, and completion of one year of treatment. So why are PARP inhibitors giving us a new hope? In the SOLO1 trial, Olaparib was used as frontline maintenance treatment for ovarian cancer patients with BRCA mutations. The seven-year follow-up showed that 67% of the patients had survived, with only one case of fatal side effects. In another trial, the Olympia, Olaparib was used as an adjuvant therapy in her two negative breast cancer patients with BRCA mutation. The results were promising. 85.9% of patients had disease-free survival, and none of the patients developed any serious side effects. Okay, now comes the final chance to collect coins. Can you say under what conditions can a doctor decide to stop Olaparib treatment? Is it option A, low red blood cell count, option B, disease recurrence, option C, extreme tiredness, or option D, nausea? The correct answer is option B, disease recurrence. Remember, this video is not intended to replace a genetic counseling session or a detailed discussion with your healthcare provider. It aims to provide educational content, and we encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your individual needs. As we wrap up today's video, I hope you've gained valuable insights into the world of PARP inhibitors and their role in BRCA mutation breast cancer. Remember, knowledge is a powerful tool, and understanding your treatment options empowers you on your journey. If you have any questions or if there is a topic you'd like us to cover in future videos, please share your thoughts in the comments below and subscribe to MHSC Medical Genomics channel. Stay informed, stay positive, 
and know that you're not alone in this journey. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to bringing you more helpful content. Take care.